in our life. This morning we are celebrating the Lord's table. I want to invite you to turn with me. We're in the book of First Peter, and we're at a passage that is a wonderful passage for the preparation for the Lord's Supper. So if you'll turn with me to First Peter chapter 5. And let's begin reading in verses 5 and 6. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Men, if you feel left out of Father's Day sermon, I confuse the calendar for Connie, and it's my fault you're not getting one. But you listen to this sermon, it'll help you as well. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Let's stand together as we read God's holy and inerrant word. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Let's bow our heads. Oh, Father, we come today to this service in which we gather around your table. And we ask, O oh Lord, that through your word, that the gospel will be proclaimed to us. And that once again in our lives that we might bow before the cross. And that we might know the majesty of who you are and that we might know the wonder and the awe and the thankfulness of sinners such as us being saved by you solely through the blood of Christ. O oh Lord, prepare our hearts today through your word. Help us, O oh Lord, to have humble hearts. Help us to have hearts that are yielded to you. And we pray this in the glorious name of Christ. Amen. This could be the anthem of our era here in America. This could be the anthem, the theme song, really, of humanity since the fall of Adam and Eve. It was written 150 years ago, but it is completely contemporary today. William Henley, out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winched nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged the punishments, the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And so man speaks, so man, you all can hear the fist in that. I am the master of the faith. I am the captain of my soul. What is pride? The scripture tells us that God is opposed to the proud. What is pride? Pride in its essence is the very heart of who we were before we became a Christian. And pride is the chief battle that we have as Christians, as we seek to live for Christ on a day-to-day -day basis. What is pride? Pride is the exaltation of self. Pride is the worship of self. Pride is naively trying to make the whole universe revolve around ourselves. Pride is seeking our joy and our pleasure and our purpose. In ourselves. It's the worship of self. We see it reflected in Isaiah chapter 14 where Satan is speaking through the king of Babylon and he says, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will make myself like the most high. Pride is heard in the words of Nebuchadnezzar. As he stands on his high porch looking out over all of Babylon. The center at that time of, of known world. 
powerful, more powerful than any nation. And he stands on his porch and he looks out over all that, and he says, look at all that I have done. And in that moment, God strikes him down and removes his sanity. Pride. Pride seen in the Gospels and the the crooked-fingered heart of the Pharisees as they look at people around them and say, thank you that I'm not like them. Thank you that I'm not like that person. Thank you that I am so righteous. Pride also comes in subtle forms. It comes in the form of stubbornness. Oh, well, none of us are like that. It comes in the form of isolation, cutting ourselves off from others. None of us are like that. It comes in the form of indifference, of looking the other way when there are needs around us. Pride comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Jonathan Edwards, the great Puritan preacher, said, Alas, how much pride have the best of us in our hearts It is the worst part of the body of sin and death, the first sin that ever entered the universe, and the last that is rooted out. It is the most stubborn enemy. I think it would not be difficult for us to say or even to be challenged that we live in a culture that very much encourages pride. We're almost at the point where the Roman... Roman world was at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a culture where if there is a God, our culture would say, then certainly we're okay with that God, and that God is okay with us. And the worst thing that we possibly could do is to say ill of ourselves. The worst thing that we could possibly do is to think something negative about ourselves. That's a culture of pride. About a million high school students, this is an, a huge survey, about a million high school students were asked in a survey, rate yourself of how well you get along with others. This is almost a million young people. 25% said they would be in the top 1% of getting along with others. said they are in the top 10% of getting along with others. That means 85% of these young people said that they were in the top 10%. What a wonderful group of young people. 0% said they were average in getting along with others. That's out of 829,000 high school seniors. None of them are average in getting along with others. Sin is blinding, and pride in itself is the most blinding of sins. Leo Tolstoy's life, by his own profession and by those around him, was a morally corrupt young man. He was a morally corrupt young man. And yet in his diary, he writes... The conviction that I am a remarkable man, this is when he was a young man in his diary, both as regards capacity and eagerness to work. I have not yet met a single man who was morally as I, and I do not remember a time I was not attracted to the good. Pride is blind. U.S. News and World Report did a survey about heaven, and it said 65% of those they surveyed, 65% said that their favorite celebrities would be in heaven. Isn't that great? You're a celebrity here, and you get to be a celebrity in heaven. You have a show here, and you can have a show in heaven. We can all watch Oprah when we get there. 75% said Mother Teresa was going to heaven. Now, salvation was by works. Mother Teresa certainly, working in the slums of India and helping the poor, she'd have a pretty good shot at it if it was by works. But salvation is not by works. It's by Christ alone, trusting in Him alone. 
65% their favorite celebrities, even further, 75%. Mother Teresa, you know who number one on the poll was coming in at a staggering 80% would go to heaven? Was themselves, the people who were surveyed. Christians certainly can be affected by pride. As we talked about, it's, it was the very heart of who we were before we became a Christian, and it is the very battle that we fight as believers. It's one of the three great avenues we see in 1 John chapter 2, and you also see it in Genesis 3, which are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's one of the great battles that we have as believers. Stephen Charnock said, he wrote the book on the attributes of God, a proud faith is as much a contradiction as a humble devil. We can become Pharisees, can't we? Our words become far more critical than they are encouraging. We can be those who, as Christ said, look at the splinter in someone else's eye and we do not see the beam the two-by-four protruding out of our own eye. It's very easy for us as Christians to become self-righteous. How do we deal with pride? How is pride to be addressed in Scripture? Are we to become monks? Are we to become monks and we live an ascetic life and we deny ourselves all these things? No. Monks can become, they're proud monks. And they can look at you and say, well, I didn't eat all day today. I didn't eat yesterday. I didn't eat the day before. I'm fasting. What about you? How spiritual are you in your life? Is the way that we gain humility by becoming monks? The answer is no. Is the way to humility by saying that we're just worms? You know, they're proud worms. Winston Churchill famously said, if men are worms, then I must be a glow worm. But we're not worms. We're created in God's image. And yet we're fallen. We have dignity and worth, but we are fallen. Our depravity is total. And actually, worms are in a better condition than we are because worms are not morally responsible to God. But we are, because we're image bearers of God, we are morally and spiritually responsible to God for our thoughts and our words and our actions. How do you remove pride and grow in humility? How does it happen? For God is opposed to the proud. Make no mistake what this passage says, that God is opposed to the proud. If we're proud, don't look for God's blessing because it will not be there. How do we become humble? How do we grow in humility? It comes through the powerful work of the Spirit in our life, through His Word. And in a direct line, it comes through comparison of all things. It comes through comparison. William Law, another Puritan, wrote in a devout call, he says this, he says, Generally speaking, humility is the least understood, the least regarded, the least intended, the least desired and sought after of all other Christian virtues. And he continues, we may as well think to see without eyes or to live without breath as to live in the Spirit of Christ without humility. The believers, apostles, those who God worked in to write the Holy Scriptures, the apostles, and those the prophets like the writer of Hebrews, when they used the word humility, they took a word and they recrafted it. The Romans had this word for humility, but to the Romans, it was a base thing. It was a despised thing. It was something that no one wanted. 
and believers looking at the life of Christ, just like what we read for the responsive reading of how Christ humbled himself even to the point of death, believers saw the model of the Lord Jesus Christ, and through the inspiration of the Spirit, they took this word that meant someone that was low and debased, and they use it to describe one who is in right relationship with God. The word humility for the Christian means literally to be in right relationship with God. It is to see God for who He truly is. And God values humility. Isaiah 66 says, There is one I esteem. He is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. And Psalm 138 says, God guides and teaches the humble. And Isaiah 66, 2 says, God regards the humble. In Isaiah 57, it says, God dwells with the contrite and lowly. In Matthew 5, 3, our Lord says, God blesses the poor in spirit. And in James 4, 6, and here in 1 Peter 5, 5, it says, God gives grace to the humble. And so what does humility look like? What does being in right relationship with God look like? How should we approach this table that God has given to us? If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Jesus teaches so powerfully. He is the greatest of teachers. Of course, he is truth itself. And here he tells a parable and how it cuts to the heart. He draws a comparison. And remember, humility comes through comparison. And he also told this parable to some people. This is verse 9 of Luke 18. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. That two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing some distance away, was un, even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so you have these two men a Pharisee and a publican. Both of these men believe that they are worshiping. Both these men believe they're worshiping. Both of these men are basing their prayers on comparison. Both of these men are notorious in Israel. The Pharisee is notorious. He is the spiritual athlete of that day. He is the quintessential spiritual box checker. God wants me to do this, check. God wants me to do this, check. Tradition wants me to do this, check. He's checking boxes all the time. He's a spiritual athlete. He's a Pharisee. The publican is notorious, for he's a traitor among his people. He is a tax gatherer, and he bid on the Romans' tax gathering plan, and he was the highest bidder. And the Romans said, whatever you can extort out of the people, apart from what you have to pay us, don't worry about the consequences. We'll look the other way. He's hated by the people. And both men are wicked. Both men are sinners. 
Let's look at the first man. He's praying. He stands there. Notice the Lord. You have to pick up the Lord's humor at times because it is in the Scripture. It's like a splinter in somebody's eye and a beam. That would cause people to laugh when they heard that because it's such an incredible hyperbole. It's a strange comparison. Well, look what the Lord says here. This would have caused snickers. Listen to what he says. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself. Do you catch what the Lord is saying? He thinks he's worshiping, but he's praying to himself. God, remember, he's praying to himself. Guess who's his God? God, I thank you that I am not like these other people. Oh, they're so terrible. They're swindlers. Thank you that I'm not a swindler. I'm better. You should be pleased with me. Thank you that I'm not unjust. I'm incredibly fair. As a matter of fact, I just tell myself repeatedly, I'm incredibly fair. And thank you. I should be pleasing to you. Thank you that I'm not an adulterer. I've, I've kept my life chaste. You should really be pleased with me. There are a lot of adulterers around you. And by the way, thank you for this living model of wretchedness, this tax collector next to me. Thank you that I'm not like him. Pride can even pervert our religion. And it makes our faith about ourselves rather than about God. Humility comes through comparison. It will never come through comparing yourself to others. It will never come by that way. It'll never come by you looking at the newspaper or media and you see some guy that's going to prison and you say, boy, I'm glad I'm not like that. It will never come by you comparing yourself horizontally. Pride will engender in your heart. You can always find someone that in your mind you think worse than you. Where does humility come from? But the tax collector standing some distance away, he's not even willing to come close. He was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. He's comparing himself not to others. He's comparing himself to God. And that is the only environment that true humility exists in. By comparing ourselves to God Himself. God is holy. I'm so unclean. God who is righteous. How many times today have I failed you? How much in my life have I failed you? A God who is just. Oh, my judging of justice is so curbed, is so self-centered. A God who is loving, who is loving, how unloving is my heart, how hard is my heart, how indifferent is my heart. A God who is merciful, oh, I want to get my due. I want to get what's owed me. A God who is so merciful. A God who forgives. Oh, I'll never forgive them. Never in my life will I forgive them. But God forgives. Forgives so powerfully in Christ. True humility comes not by comparing ourselves to others comes by comparing ourselves to God, looking in His Word, looking at His law, 
and seeing how far we we fall short of his presence. The longest psalm in the scripture is Psalm 119. It's 176 verses in a highly poetic manner. It all starts with the same letter in each one of the each one of the sections. And it is David meditating on God's law for a hundred and seventy-six verses. He meditates on the law of God. And in verse 176, listen to what he says. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant. For I do not forget thy commandments. After 175 meditations on the law of God, the only conclusion that David can come up with is that I am a lost sheep who has gone astray. Oh God, you must seek me because I am so sinful. That's what this table is about today. It is about coming to the table. The table is a physical representation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a physical representation that the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, came and took on human flesh, body and blood, took on human flesh, and did for us what we could not do for ourselves, and that is be perfectly obedient to God. And it's about coming to that table and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ that at some point in our life, if we come to this table today, it means that there was some point in our life where we began to stop comparing ourselves to others. And we began to look at who God truly is. And we recognized we are completely inadequate. We are completely helpless. We have nothing in our hands to bring. Simply to the cross, we must cling. It is all of Christ. And that is what we're coming to this table today for. To say by testimony and to say by the means of grace, receiving it by faith, that salvation and the Christian life itself is all of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh, Father, we pray that you would forgive us of our pride. Oh, that it would be that our pride was like clothes that we could take off. But, Lord, it is deep in our heart. It is systemic to our system. And Lord, there will be a day when the battle with pride will be over. That will be the day that we die. Or the day that you return. Forgive us, O Lord, of our blindness. Help us, O Lord, to know that it is only by your unmerited favor. It is only through the grace of Christ on the cross, that we can stand before you, that we can kneel before you, that we can worship you. Oh Lord, I pray that all of us today will confess our pride. I pray that we would empty our hearts of all self-reliance, self-dependence, self-righteousness. And we would come with empty hands to this table, asking you to fill them with Christ, to renew us in our life before Him. If there is anyone who does not know Christ, I pray that even today that you, like Nebuchadnezzar, you will break their pride, Lord. That you will humble them before you. That through the power of your Spirit, you will give them a new heart. And they will declare, O oh Lord, I cannot stand before your word. I cannot stand before your law. I cannot stand before you. And so I plead with Christ. I repent of my sin. I return from myself. And I turn to Christ. To Christ. To Christ. Christ alone.
pray this in Christ's name. Amen.